excited to bring the message. I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you will. We're going to be reading a passage of Scripture from Isaiah chapter 7 and also Matthew chapter 1. We've been in a series the past several weeks in the book of Genesis, but we're going to break from that for the next few weeks. In this season of, of Christmas in December, uh, we're going to be focusing on that. And so the message that uh, bringing this morning is entitled Never Alone. We're talking about Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Aren't you thankful that we serve a God who is with us? He's with us here, and he's with you wherever you go. He's with you through everything that you face in your life. So while you're turning in your Bibles to Isaiah 7, Matthew chapter 1, uh, at the end of my message this morning, we're going to have a time for altar ministry. And so this morning, as we talk about Emmanuel, God with us, if you're feeling alone or you're feeling abandoned, maybe, maybe you feel today far from God just sensing his presence with you. You need to experience his presence, his love, his mercy, his grace, his peace, his joy, whatever it might be. You need God's strength and comfort. I want you to be ready to respond and, and uh, we're gonna invite you to come and we're gonna pray and we're gonna believe God to meet us right here. I believe that we're on the verge of God really doing some incredible, amazing things, testimonies of what he has done not just what he's capable of doing. How many of you know our God can do absolutely anything? And so no matter how desperate you feel this morning, God wants to meet you here. He wants to love on you and he wants to help you. And I'm, I'm, I'm asking that you would respond. I've got a short amount of time to give you a lot of information. So buckle up and here we go. Isaiah chapter seven. These are prophetic words from Isaiah about the coming Messiah. This was written over 700 years before Jesus came to earth. Isaiah chapter seven, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Now turn over to Matthew chapter one while, or while you're flipping over there. The, the name Emmanuel only happens three times in scripture. Isaiah chapter seven, you can turn over uh, to Isaiah chapter eight and you'll see the name Emmanuel in eight, verse eight, and also in Matthew chapter one. And I want to read for you starting at verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Verse 22, all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Very good. Jesus has many titles and names that are given to him throughout Scripture. Besides the name Jesus, which means Savior, besides Emmanuel, which means God with us, he is also called the door, the way, the bread of life, the light of the world the living water, and the good shepherd. Isaiah chapter nine calls him wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, the prince of peace. Revelation calls him the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. In John chapter one, he refers to him as the word. Each of his names give insight into his nature, into his character. But the name Emmanuel, God with us, there is something profound about that name. Of all the names that he has, none of them are as endearing as the name Emmanuel. God with us. Speaks of God's continual and his persistent presence. Matthew connects this prophecy of Isaiah to the, fulfill the fulfillment of that prophecy to Jesus. God came to live in Israel. He was born of Mary through a virgin birth. He came to live in Israel with his people. God with us. Jesus, the Emmanuel. Jesus was God with us, manifested in human flesh. This is what John says in John chapter 1, verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Verse 18 says, no one has ever seen God. But the one and only Son, who is himself God, 
and is the closest relationship with the Father has made him known. We know God because we know Jesus. God is omnipotent, meaning that he is all-powerful. There is nothing that God cannot do. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. There is nothing that he doesn't know. He knows everything that there is to know. And he's omnipresent, meaning that he's present everywhere. Here's what I want to tell you this morning. You are never alone. And that's the title of the message this morning, never alone. This is what the psalmist David said in Psalm 139. He said, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride on the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. There is nowhere that we can go where God is not. And we read about this promise of God this morning throughout Scripture where he says, I will be with you. Over and over and over, he gives this promise. He spoke these words to Moses. When he, when he called Moses, he said, Moses, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to set my people free. And Moses responded, who am I? Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the Israelites out of Egypt? And what was God's answer? I'm with you. That's enough. Joshua, who followed Moses, he spoke to him in Joshua chapter one and said, the time has come for you to lead the Israelites across the Jordan River into the land that I'm giving you. I promise you what I promised Moses. He says, wherever you set your foot, that'll be the land that I give you. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you. I will not abandon you. Gideon, God called Gideon to, to fight the, the army. And, and we see an angel from the Lord shows up to him and he's, he's threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press, hiding from the Midianites. And, and God, through the angel, responds to him. He calls him mighty hero. The Lord is with you. That's how he responds. And Gideon's going, who are, you, who are you talking when you say mighty hero? God is with us. And his response is this. He says, sir, to the angel, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? You ever asked that question before? God, if you're with us, why is all this junk happening in my life? Maybe you've tried to answer that question for somebody else before. They're asking the same question. If God is with us and God is for us, why is all this going on? And, and he goes on to say, where are the miracles our ancestors talked about? The Lord brought us out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. And the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have, I'm sending you. And he said, Lord, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest of the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I'm the least of my family. He's saying, listen, I'm the last person that you should be asking. I'm the last person that you, sent, you should send. And the Lord says to him, I am with you. Over and over, we get this response. We see the, the story of Joseph in, in the book of Genesis. And in one chapter, chapter 39, where he is sold as a slave into Egypt, twice God says he was with Joseph. He was then thrown into prison for a false accusation, and twice in the time in prison that he spent there, maybe 10, 11 years, all total about 13 years, four times in that chapter, it says that the Lord was with Joseph. Getting back to, to Jesus, he was given the name God with us because he was God with us in Jesus. God walked and talked with his people just as he did with Adam and Eve, who we've been talking about in the Garden of Eden. Matthew 28, 20, Jesus gives this promise. He said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Romans 8 gives us this promise that nothing can ever separate us from the love of God. Nothing can ever separate us from God. Here's what we need to know this morning is that we are never alone. And this name Emmanuel, God with us, speaks to three important things that I want to share with you briefly this morning. And the first one is help. His help Jesus came to be God with us, but he didn't plan to stay here long in person. His life was short-lived here on this earth. He came to live as one of us, as an example for us to follow, and he came to die to give his life as a ransom to save and reclaim mankind. Jesus talking to his disciples at the end, he, was no, he knew he was nearing the end where he would give his life and this is what he says to his disciples, a passage of scripture that you're very familiar with in John chapter 14. He says to his disciples, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you will be, also will be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas, one of the disciples, said, Lord, we have no clue where you're going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John chapter 14, a few verses later, Jesus says this. He says, if you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate. If you're looking in your Bible, depending on the version, it may say he will give you a helper, an advocate, a helper, a counselor, a comforter. That's what he's saying. I I will give you the advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth, the the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. He's speaking of himself. In the New Living Translation, he says, you know him for he lives with you now. Right here, he's speaking of himself, Jesus, God incarnate, living right with him. And he says, and later he will be in you, speaking of the spirit that was to come that would live in them. In John chapter 16, he says this, but now I'm, I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me where are you going. Rather, you're filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is good that I am going away. Jesus said, I need to go away. It's good that I go away. Unless I go away, the advocate or the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. He's saying, look, it's good for me to go because I will send the Holy Spirit who will be a helper. His presence, Emmanuel with us, speaks to his help for us. He knows what is best for us, and he said, it's good that I go away. When God promises to be with us, listen, he's not saying, I'm just with you as an observer. He's saying, I'm with you as your help, your helper. In fact, by promising his presence, what he promises is strength, encouragement, his power, his success in our life, and victory over the enemy, of all of our enemies. When the Holy Spirit comes, he says he will be with you, to lead you, to guide you, to empower you, and to help you. How many of you experienced the Holy Spirit that way? Not just momentary, but we experience him forever and always. Jesus said this in Matthew 28, 20. He said, be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. That's a personal promise to each and every one of you. I want you, just put your name in there. And Jeff, be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Rod, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Bob, I'm with you always, to the very end of the age. This is his promise to us. In Hebrews 13, chapter 13, verse five, he said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? God is our helper and he is with us. He is with us to help us, not just to make us feel good. So many people are looking for God to give them a good feeling. But listen, whether you have a good feeling or not, you can know that he is with you and that he is there to help you. And he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He'll never turn his back on you. He'll never let you go. That is his promise to us. He is God, our help. Don't let your life revolve around the things of this world. Back in 13.5, this is a, a, a passage that sometimes I look at that and I'm thinking, how do we connect those two thoughts? Because the first thought in Hebrews 13.5 says, don't love money, be satisfied with what you have. And then he goes on to say, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. You can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? So to put that in context, don't let your life revolve around the things of this world. Don't let your confidence be in your ability to earn money. Don't let your confidence be in your your ability to save for retirement. Listen, God is your help, not money. Your status in life as a, whatever it is that you've done and achieved in your life, that is not your help. God is your helper. Don't put your hope and trust and confidence in the material things and the possessions of this world. Put your hope in God who promises to never leave you. He will always be with you and he's there to help. 
Not only is he there to help, he is Emmanuel God with us and he gives us hope. He is our help, he is our hope. God being with us doesn't mean that we're, we're not gonna face tests and trials. And we can all evidence, we can all say we've evidenced that today. Just because God is with us doesn't mean we're exempt from trials or tests or challenges or diagnosis or whatever it might be and that should give us hope. It should give us hope that he is with us through those times. You've heard me say this before, that the hope that we read in Scripture isn't a hope so like I hope I have enough money to pay all my bills. I hope, I hope, I hope. It's a, it's a no-so kind of hope. The hope that we have in Jesus is a, is, a, is a hope that says we know that he is with us, we know that he loves us, we know that he's for us, we know that he helps us, and he gives us that hope in seemingly hopeless situations. You ever faced a seemingly hopeless situation? And you've asked this question, you, you say, God, you're with us, but how, how do you describe what's going on in my world right now? If you're with us, how could you let these things happen? Listen to what David said in Psalm 3. I'm gonna read this for you. He says, oh Lord, I have so many enemies. So many are against me. So many are saying God will never rescue him. But you, oh Lord, are a shield around me. You are my glory and the one who holds my head high. I cried out to the Lord and he answered me from his holy mountain. I lay down and slept, yet I woke up in safety for the Lord was watching over me. I am not afraid of 10,000 enemies who surround me on every side. Arise, O Lord, rescue me, my God. And listen to what he says right after that. Slap all my enemies in the face. How many of you have ever prayed that before? How many of you have ever seen that before? This is New Living Translation. I give you permission to take that verse and pray that every day. God, slap all my enemies in the face. I think the other versions say it too, too weak. God, smite them on the cheek. No, slap them. <laughs> all my enemies. God, you're my hope. My hope is in you. I know that you can handle this. I know that you can do this. Shatter the teeth of the wicked. Victory comes from you, O Lord. May you bless your people. David's rejoicing in the presence of God with him. God can turn around any and every situation. That's the hope that we have in God. He can change anything. Our hope is in the name of Jesus, the name that's above every name. Our hope is in his presence and his power. He can do anything. He raises the dead. He's done it before. Do you think he can do it again? He can feed 5,000 with a Lunchable. This is our God. He can calm a raging storm with one word, one spoken word. He can heal a blind man who was blind from birth. He came into the darkness and he commanded light. He can come into your chaos and he can bring order. Our Thanksgiving service just a week and a half ago, we had a testimony of someone that's new to our church and she shared the story about how she was diagnosed years ago with MS and had gotten to the point where she could hardly walk. Gotten to the point where she was pretty much confined to her wheelchair and was having trouble even breathing. Went to a, a service. God met her there. God healed her. And her and her husband were sitting in my office on Thursday for an hour and a half telling about the good things that God has done. God saved them out of a, a, a religion that was completely different than Christianity. And he has showed them his powerful hand of healing. And if he can do that for her, he can do that for any one of us today. She is completely healed and walking completely fine and breathing perfectly. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And though our, 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 our future may be uncertain, we don't have to be afraid or hopeless. He says to you what he said to Joshua, as I was with Moses, shall, so shall I be with you. We can believe that God is with us. David rejoices in the Psalms. He said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 46, one, God is our refuge and strength and ever present help in trouble. How many of you stood on that verse before? God, you are my ever present help in times of trouble. He said, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me. 
Even through the darkest valley, God, you are with me. There's nothing that God can't do. There's nothing that's too difficult for him. Isaiah 41, 10 says, don't be afraid for I am with you. Don't be discouraged for I am your God and I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. Isaiah 43, 2, when you go through deep waters, I'll be with you. When you go through the fire, you will not be burned. Listen, God is with you. I want to I want to share a story with you this morning, and um, I, I need you to pay close attention. But I'm going to read the story so that I don't lose the details. But when we talk about God, who is our hope, in spite of a hopeless, hopeless-looking situation, 1921, a missionary couple named David and Savea Flood went from Sweden to the Belgian Congo in Africa. They met up with a, a couple named the Ericsons, and they felt led by the Lord to go out from the main mission station and take the gospel to an unreached remote area. And when they arrived at that village, they were rebuffed by the chief who would not let them enter his town for fear of alienating their gods. The two couples opted to go a half mile up the slope and build their own mud huts. They prayed for a spiritual breakthrough, but there was none. The only contact with the villagers was a young boy who was allowed to sell them chickens and eggs twice a week. Svea Flood decided that if this was the only African that she could talk to, that she would try to lead this boy to Jesus, and she succeeded. But there was no other fruit of their ministry there in Africa. Meanwhile, malaria struck, and in time, the Ericsons decided that they'd had enough of the suffering, and they left to return to uh, their central mission station. David and Svea Flood remained near the village in their mud hut up on the slope to go it on, go on alone. Svea found herself pregnant in the middle of the primitive wilderness. And when the time came for her to give birth, the village chief softened enough to allow a midwife to help her deliver this little girl whom they named Ina. The delivery was exhausting and Svea uh, Flood, who was already weak from, the bout, from bouts with malaria, uh, she died 17 days later after giving birth to this little girl. Something snapped inside of her husband, David. He dug a crude grave and buried his wife. He came down the mountain to the mission station. He gave his newborn daughter to the Ericsons. And before leaving, he said this, I'm going back to Sweden. I've lost my wife, and I obviously can't take care of this baby. God has ruined my life. And with that, he headed for the port, rejecting not only his calling, but God himself. Within eight months, both of the Ericsons died within days of each other. And this baby was turned over to some American missionaries who adjusted her Swedish name to be Aggie and eventually brought her to the United States. Her adopted dad became a pastor and Aggie grew up in South Dakota and she attended North Central Bible College where she met and married a man named Dewey Hurst. That baby from the Congo, now a young wife, one day, a Swedish religious magazine appeared in her mailbox. And she couldn't read the words, but she, as she turned the pages, a photo stopped her cold. There in the primitive setting of Africa was a grave with a white cross with the name of her mother, Svea Flood. A translator summarized the story about missionaries who had come to a village long ago, a birth of a white baby, the death of a young mother, the one little African boy who had been led to Christ, and how after the whites had all left, the boy had grown up and finally persuaded the chief to let him build a school in that village. The article said that gradually he won all of his students to Christ. The children led their parents to Christ. Even the chief had become a Christian. Today there were 600 Christian believers in that one village, all because of the sacrifice of David and Svea Flood. Years later, Aggie sought to find her real father in Sweden, an old man now. David Flood had remarried, fathered four more children, and generally dissipated his life with alcohol. He had recently suffered a stroke. Still better, he had one rule in his family, never mention the name of God because God took everything from me. Aggie was not to be deterred. She walked into his squalid apartment with bottles of alcohol everywhere and approached the 73-year-old man lying on a rumpled bed. Papa, she said tentatively, and he turned and began to cry. Ina, he said, I never meant to give you away. It's all right, Papa, she replied, taking him in her arms. God took care of me. The man instantly stiffened and said, God forgot all of us. Our lives have been like this because of him. He turned his face back to the wall, and she stroked his face and continued undaunted. Papa, I've got a little story to tell you, and it's a true one. 
You didn't go to Africa in vain. Mama didn't die in vain. The little boy that you won to the Lord grew up to win that whole village to Jesus Christ. The one seed you planted just kept growing and growing, and today there are 600 African people serving the Lord because you were faithful to the call of God on your life. Papa, Jesus loves you. He's never hated you. The old man turned back to look at his daughter in the eyes. His body began to relax. He began to talk, and by the end of that afternoon, he had come back to God, the God he had resented for so many decades, and within a few weeks, David Flood had gone into eternity. A few years later, Aggie attended a large evangelism conference in London. A report was given from Congo by the superintendent of that national church representing over 100,000 baptized believers. He spoke eloquently of the gospel spread in his country. Aggie asked him afterwards if he had ever heard of David and Svea flood. Yes, ma'am, the man replied in French, his words translated into English. It was Svea flood who led me to Jesus Christ. This is the man who's over the church in Congo. I was the boy who brought chickens and eggs to your parents before you were even born. In fact, to this day, your mother's grave and her memory are honored by all of us. You must come to Africa and see because your mother is the most famous person in our history. Ever been in a situation where it seemed hopeless and you couldn't see how things are gonna work out? This is our God. Joseph spent 13 years in prison and as a slave. But God was with him. And at the end, his brothers were fearing for their life because they had sold him into slavery. And they were afraid he was going to take their life. And he said, listen, what you intended for evil, God has worked for good. And it's the saving of lives. It was for this moment that you sold, that you sold me into, into slavery. We have a God who brings hope. Not only help, but he brings hope. And he brings healing. God heals relationships. God heals brokenness in our bodies. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. And John chapter 3 says he came to Jesus at night because he couldn't be seen by that he was going to see Jesus. And he said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who's come from God, for no one could perform the signs that you were doing if God was not with him. He is God. What is it that you need today? I want to ask you to stand.